Thank you for joining us today uh, for AMATIC webinar. If you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC. We would also like to thank McGraw-Hill Higher Education, the proud supporter of the AMATIC webinar series for 2023. Please connect with AMATIC on social media, Facebook, Twitter. Welcome to the My AMATIC website as well. And additionally, we have um, a variety of professional development opportunities and publications. Our next annual conference is coming up in Omaha. Yay. Are you the next AMATIC webinar presenter? Maybe. If you have a great webinar idea and are ready to share, submit your idea using the AMATIC webinar proposal form via the QR code. Any AMATIC webinar is recorded and posted to our archive page. Please allow up to two weeks to produce and upload a recorded webinar to the archive. And as additional note, the views expressed by the presenters are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by the presenter are not endorsed by AMATIC. So today we have Enhancing Equity with Course-Based Undergraduate Research Experiences. Today's presenter is Frank Marfai. I'm hoping I'm doing good. Following a successful career in the aerospace industry, Frank started teaching mathematics at the college level in 1999 and taught at various community colleges, both in California and Arizona. He received his PhD in mathematics education from Arizona State University in 2016. He's been a residential faculty member at Phoenix College since 2013. Uh, AMATIC webinars are great professional developments from the comfort of your office or your home for a group of faculty or an individual. It's a time to share, to discuss, and to learn. We would appreciate your feedback, and we look forward to reviewing your responses for this webinar survey. At the end or towards the end of our um, webinar today, which is about an hour long, I will post the uh, attendee survey in the chat for you to complete. It'll also be emailed to you. And so now I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and switch it over to Frank. Wonderful. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Let's see. I hope you guys can see me. Happy Star Wars Day. I'm sure you can see uh, the Mandalorian and Darth Vader behind. And um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to share my screen. And let's find out how that works. I believe it's going to be this one. And uh, my question would be is, can you guys see this slide? Looks good. Okay, perfect. So you, what you're going to be asked to do is to actually vote. And part of that is also getting, uh, it's fun, a fun way to, um, a fun way to determine um, how to use the interface. So you're going to vote now. So you, sh you should see a poll. Um, so uh, Robin, um, I'm pretty sure everyone um, okay, in terms of audio. So uh, check your audio on your end, okay? We'll give it just a couple more minutes, or maybe a minute. We all, we have seven of ten. Once I end the poll, it'll um, be shared. So you let me know when you're ready to end. One of the things I'm learning is that once I go into presentation mode, I cannot see the chat. Oh, yes, I got you. Robin's able to hear now, so we're good to go. Wonderful. So we have eight of 11. I'm going to go ahead and end it for you. And so you should be able to see the results. So uh, one fun thing is, is not everybody sometimes can see it, especially in the recording. So I just want to kind of give a heads up. Um, 75% answered they would rather have uh, someone older than someone younger, which was 25%. Awesome. So much wisdom you will have. Let's see how the presentation goes. We hope wisdom shall be bestowed. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna go like this. And again, um, if you weren't aware, uh, unless it uh, may the fourth be with you, is an actual official holiday. So totally had a little fun with it. I mean, we are 
having a presentation on May the 4th. Thank you all so much for coming to this presentation. Um, I'm hoping that um, what you will find is valuable and will really um, help your professional learning. Uh, again, thank you for coming and let's get started. So what's going to happen is this um, presentation is about enhancing equity with course-based undergraduate research experiences. My name is Frank Marfi. I teach at Phoenix College. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, this has been supported by a National S uh, Foundation grant. Um, again, the conclusions are my own. So um, let's get started. So first of all, the goals of this presentation are what, first of all, what a course-based undergraduate research experience is. Um, also what the benefit, uh, which is um, the acronym I'll be using is CURE. Uh, also the benefits of CURES to students, like what, what does it do for them? Um, the steps that were used to implement a CURE in my courses. And um, back when I started, I thought I could be sharing best practices, but really it's more about lessons learned to have a successful CURE experience in a course and the different modalities because we've all been through the pandemic. And so when CURE started, um, this was something that we did in person. So how, what, you know, what were the lessons learned, what's working, what doesn't work. And I'm giving it from the perspective of teaching a statistics course. Um, cures are something, let's see, let me do like this. So um, cures are, are actually taught in multiple disciplines. The one that's gonna be, be, uh, be I'm focusing on is math and statistics education. So one of the things is, is um, first of all, it's like Phoenix College is part of the Maricopa Community College system. So you might wonder where that is. Well, it's in Arizona and Phoenix College is in the center of downtown Phoenix. Um, so that's just kind of like to get a sense of like, okay, where is it? So a CURE, this is short for a course-based undergraduate research experience. And I'm hoping, well, I think you guys look at my screen, but my light just turned off uh, because it is an uh, office that just, I'm not moving enough. Okay, so it's course for, uh, short for um, a course-based undergraduate research experience. And what's uh, special about that is that every student is involved. And so why do we do cures at uh, Phoenix College and also Maricopa Community Colleges in, in general? So one of the things is when we look at the demographics, um, we are an HSI, which is a Hispanic serving uh, institute. And most of our students, I would say a majority of our students are Hispanic or minoritized. So for example, about three quarters of our students would be considered underserved. Um, from a population demographic, about two thirds are Hispanic, also uh, about two thirds are female. Now, when you look at the STEM disciplines, because this is um, implementing a cure in a STEM based course, specifically mathematics and statistics, um, what happens here is um, when we look at the this, um, demographics of those who graduate, that is not the case. So those who graduate from STEM are not represented by students who come. So the question is, how do we enhance equity? And one of the methods is a cure. So um, how does it work? How do we prom and, and produce or help um, create equity through cures? So first of all, this is part of a district initiative. So it started at Phoenix College, the principal investigators are at Phoenix College. Um, so what it is, is it's where it began, but it actually is um, part of, uh, and the idea is to integrate research experience to create students access to and success in STEM careers. What's different about a research experience like this is that every single student in your class is a participant in research. So what's different about that is in some cases, like you have a grant, you might be able to maybe support maybe two or three students, but in here, every single student in your class. So when we're thinking about um, the students who attend our classes, everyone gets an opportunity. So students who are traditionally underserved, or might not have thought that they could apply to do it, they're getting that actual career experience in undergraduate research. And part of that is again, giving them that experience that they can then use, uh, put on a resume to um, gain access to either fur further research, further internships, or possibly their career. When we look at all the students who've been impacted um, uh, in a cure, um, so far, and then these are a little bit old, so um, the, a website from the district has not been updated yet, but um, 22 cures were developed. So far, 1,036 student participants, about 70 faculty participants, 
uh, 15 courses with Cure of Mind is an example of, of some of those sections and seven colleges of the 10 colleges are participating because um, the nice thing about where um, we, our district is located is, is we were able to collaborate with colleagues across different, co our sister colleges to uh, really um, create a systemic uh, intervention. So um, the next part of the presentation, we'll talk about the sources of inspiration how did I even come up with this? It's implementation through, in my statistics course, um, again, cures are, um, we're kind of, I would say, when I'm looking at the, the fields of STEM, I think the math and statistics education is late to this. Yeah, I would even say physical sciences. Biology has, has, has several years ahead of us. So a lot of um, what is influ um, influenced has been um, from my biology colleagues, which I am thankful for having that experience. And then also, how does a capstone project work? So the way we implement a cure is through a capstone project that is part of the course that everyone participates in. So I'm gonna ask you right now, okay, just kind of give a very brief intro of what a cure is. I've not talked about at this point um, how I did it. I'm kind of curious what you guys, what your experiences are. So again, in honor of Star Wars Day, because it is May the 4th, um, founding a youngling means you're just new to this and you, um, this might be your first exposure to it. Had one, maybe a little bit, you're getting experience Jedi Knight or Jedi Master, you're a pro. So um, we're going to do a, a quick poll. I'm still curious to see where you guys are all at. I went ahead and launched the poll, okay? Thank you very much. I might try to change the lighting here. Let's see if that okay, go ahead. I don't know if that helps any. My lights must still turn off. At least oh yeah, time. that yeah. I might have to do that from time to time because. Oh yeah, it's one of those lights don't actually detect that I'm in my own office, which is great. <laughs> it's fun. I love that. Well, if this is live, really, so it has to be something. Of course. All right, so I think we've got everybody answered. So we have 33% um, are um, the baby Yoda. Uh, Padawan is 22%. Jedi Knight is 44%. And no one is a Jedi Master. Okay, wonderful. So um, where I would consider myself is somewhere between Padawan and Jedi Knight at this point uh, myself. When I first started this, I was a total foundling and I did everything wrong. So um, I, this um, presentation is actually addressed to all different stages of where you're at in your um, trajectory of your professional learning when it has to come to cures. My assumption when I created this is that most of uh, who's in attendance is somewhere along that spectrum. So let's, let's go forward. So I was when I started a foundling or youngling. And so I can tell you mistakes that I made. If it helps you not make those mistakes, great. Um, but let's go forward. So I'm going to go like this. So my journey to cures and the lessons learned. And the lessons continue to be learned because one of the lessons is also being open to adapting. So my sources of inspiration, like, okay, where did this come from? So not coming from bio, the biosciences, um, field where I, this is a more prominent practice, my uh, inspiration actually came from two parts. One of them actually was from a presentation at Imatic. It was in actually in 2018. And of course, this is the one where it was located in Orlando, very close to Disney World. That's why you see it kind of looking very carousel and festive. Um, I went to a presentation by Sean Ferozian, and he was talking about implementing research projects into um, a course, and he described how he did it. Um, and I started thinking like, that's an interesting idea at the very same. And so I said, I wish I could do this in my courses. I can, I can sort of see a path forward in my discipline, like how it's done at the very same time. I was talking to my, um, colleagues in the biosciences department, and they were starting to create a grant, um, which eventually led to the MCCD, uh, STEM cure, which, which, um, this is 
part of, uh, that we are part of. So when we look at it, um, having that conversation and being invited, like, would you like to be a first adopter? Uh, we're, we're about to implement cures. Um, would you like to do it? And I said, sure, um, let's try it. Um, what's nice about it, there's a supportive ecosystem. And so I was one of the first cohorts um, and so uh, previous collaborations with colleagues from outside the discipline, that is really something I found valuable, especially in terms of helping me think outside of my own discipline's box. So what are the benefits of CURES? First of all, what, um, the benefits of CURES is that there's a student interest and engagement and that all students in class benefit. One of the decisions that I made was um, it should be personally relevant to the students. So that gives them the freedom and autonomy to choose what they wanna research. And there's mutual benefit of that and that they're actually answering a question that is novel to them, that they don't know the answer and perhaps has not been researched. So they're not doing a book report, they're really going and doing research based on what I made a decision on as public databases and partners. Um, so for mutual benefit is for students. Now I will talk about what a student success specialist um, one of the things that was necessary to make this work was also to include a student success specialist. It is kind of the close analog of a TA, um, except they don't grade. So, but what it is, is they've been prior, um, they've been prior, um, I lost my train of thought, I apologize. I have people visiting at my door. So, you know, live, what is it, live stream. Um, so, I lost my, they didn't knock though, um, okay. So student success specialist, and then also for an industry and community partner. So what it is is by working with a partner, we also have the opportunity to find something of mutual interest. Like, okay, they wanna know the answer to this and our students wanna learn statistics and it also, when they did get an answer, they will find it relevant to them. Now, what is another benefit of CURES is that it also, um, the working hypothesis of the STEM CURE team is that, um, through the STEM Cure Foundation, and this was um, research-based. So, um, and we're now in the process of starting to analyze the data and come up with findings that, um, but that is kind of, we're now at the end of stage of the project. So we're gonna learn that. But one of the things is this idea of scientific li literacy and self-efficacy in STEM and motivation in science and interest in STEM and uh, careers and uh, persistence and feeling like they themselves could do research. You don't need to have a PhD to do research. You can do it at a community college level. That was something that was novel because there was um, research based on undergraduate research at the four-year institution. So um, what the MCC uh, DSEM Cure was doing is where they, you don't have to wait till you're in um, a four-year school at a university. You can do cures. It's possible to do it at the community college level. So this is the pyramid. And a lot of what we're uh, an analyzing now that now the project is starting to wrap up is what happens um, yeah, to students' um, beliefs. Uh, well, so far, early data suggests, but well, we'll get to it, um, but early uh, data suggests it's actually a very positive outcome for students and their resilience and their belief in, and ownership and opportunities. Okay, partners. So I did talk about STEM Cure. So they've been a, a wonderful partner and very, very supportive. Um, it is a district project. Um, the core team is at Phoenix College. I also am thankful to the institution itself because they let us do this. And also um, were, I would say more, um, they were supportive of classes, especially when it came to after the pandemic because our class sizes were smaller and they would still allow it to run because it is again, was demonstrated to be a best practice. Also our partners we're thankful to. Um, this is over the years, we've worked with the Arizona Department of Health Services, which is basically the state analog of the CDC. And we've also worked with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, which is the state analog of the EPA. So you might be wondering like, what are some projects that students would pick? Because they have the autonomy to pick. And oftentimes we also are partners in the way they supported us is they would oftentimes, it, because we, they asked, would you, like us, would you like us to come to class and do a presentation? And the answer was, of course. So um, we uh, oftentimes those conversations with, between students and the industry partner led them to say they want to study this and where the partner was very helpful is they provide the data. So um, public databases is one way to get the data. The other way was through the partner. And a lot of these you will notice like anything that has to do with water quality or air quality was because of direct contribution help of the partner. Um, so in spring 2020, um, these are some examples of some of the cures. So you'll notice it kind of is very it's varied. 
um, you'll also notice in fall 20, like, um, and this, what's interesting to note about this is as students, you know, because they have the autonomy, every semester had a very different cadence of what students actually cared about. So for example, when, when COVID hit, it ended up being much more health related and also much more about just understanding, um, air, you know, understanding uh, things that have to do with COVID. Um, later on, there had there was more um, there were more talks about mental health and um, trying to you know um, healthy living, and trying to understand um, healthcare and understanding seasonal affective disorder. So there was a lot of these interesting um, and uh, trying to understand mental health. So I think uh, again each of each student group depending on the time, and then they uh, this fall twenty one was the first semester where we now had it um, coming back. Uh, to in-person classes. And then also here's some more as well. And again, each one of these represent something that the groups themselves chose. So you might be wondering, okay, how do you set up a course? And this is something that I had a trouble wrapping my mind around in the beginning. It's like, okay, I have these competencies. We all have competencies we need to teach. And it's like, you're saying, okay, you must do this. So how does one then take that and so the way it works is the course itself, where we're going with the competencies and uh, the different course objectives. What I did is I compressed the course into 10 weeks. And what I did is because there's a lot of descriptive, uh, descriptive statistics used at the, um, during the capstone project, I minimized that part because I knew they would use it at the very end of the course. The pilot that we had in the beginning was in fall 2020, uh, 2019. We use an OER textbook, OpenStax, there was online homework and videos, small group projects, and a lot of those small group projects also used um, bits and pieces of data so that they would get used to using spreadsheet software or statistical software. And again, the course competencies were covered. Um, and then this was followed by a six week capstone project. So they had six weeks to do it and it was very structured in terms of like um, creating milestones and deadlines so that by the time they finished, they end up with a completed capstone project that they will present in front of um, faculty, staff, and invited um, partners. So the project again, so there were some criteria. So the project was chosen, it should be of interest to them, um, should be having easy acquirable data. And I put an asterisk, if you have a partner, that's an instant source of data. And there's also public databases and they just need to be confirmed that they're accurate if, if it's from the internet. Um, it should be of social relevance beyond the niche interest. Sometimes that would, uh, sometimes a student group would suggest something they wanted to do and it's like, nobody, uh, other than the group itself, it, can, can we imagine that this is going to be um, something that everyone will listen to? And then it also should be done as a team of two or three. I learned that early on, that if you have a team of four, it oftentimes doesn't go well. So I made the rule that you can only have up to three. So resources for students, what's really, really important as we develop this, in the beginning, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm very thankful to my success specialists um, in each semester because they have taught me something very, very important about you know, ways to improve. Um, so one of the resources, a student success specialist, they have done a cure in their um, course before. Uh, when we first started, um, we had um, one of our success specialists who had done a cure in biosciences so she knew a lot about how to um, make a cure work in another discipline. And after that, then we had the knowledge build up from students who took the statistics course and then became the success specialist. So they became like a student mentor. And um, there were certain criteria. So they were a former student of the cure class. They had the content knowledge and the empathy because sometimes, uh, and they, so what it is is, Oftentimes they were not the, the strong A student. They were the students who had to work for their A and they, you know, they were also helpful to their um, peers. They were, um, they worked well with others. Um, they genuinely, it, one of those things is you know, being very careful about who you select as your specialist because they're gonna be the student mentor for the next um, cohort. Um, and also working with them as a partner to implement the lessons. And again, I am forever grateful to every one of my specialists. They have brought something new and, and they have a lasting impact on here. So it got mo uh, modified and um, iterated and improved upon each and each time. And so one of the things that is a resource for students is they have an entire library of previous posters from the previous um, cures that were made. 
So that's, for example, you see kind of like a small image of like they could see posters from other student groups. And oftentimes during this feedback loop um, that is used, like please refer to um, such and such group's poster because that might help you see a, a different path to how you're doing it. And then since all the projects are unique, they could learn like how was another group successful and use that as kind of a um, model of what could be done for that project. So previous student presentations were also shared. What it is is I do video record um, the presentations and then it's then listed on YouTube unlisted. Um, so for example, during the Zoom presentations, I would record just like where we're having a recording now. And then it was available to uh, students just in the class. And those are the uh, Zoom presentations. Now, by, by you coming to this presentation, you now have access also to a library of videos here of the particular um, presentation. So if you're trying to understand how does it even work, you can do that. So if you're doing your classes through Zoom, that was some examples. And there was also the in-person presentations. Um, the other thing that was provided was a classroom template. Um, so a poster template. This was built by one of our success specialists. Um, it's been small, modified and tweaked a little bit over the years, but um, pretty much they don't have to create a poster from scratch. And this is actually a miniaturized version of what eventually becomes a 48 by 36 inch poster. And so, and what you see here is that the students film the template. The different parts that you see here um, were actually, this is actually from the influence also of that AMATIC presentation that I had. The idea of uh, splitting the method section into two parts that we had to deliberately talk about the research setup and the data collection was a, a, a positive influence um, from that 2018 presentation. And then there's also downloadable. So if you, let's say, after this presentation, go, yep, I want to do a cure. You can start. You don't have to start from scratch. Um, you can download a, a template and use it and adapt it to your own needs. The other part that was done, and we learned that through different iterations, is working with um, my success specialist, is that what might be considered like, oh yeah, I just you know fill in this portion of the poster and it means this. Oftentimes that was lost in translation because uh, as content experts, sometimes we're not able to communicate to our students, here's what the different portions of a poster represent. So what working with our success specialist, because they were fresh to them and understood freshly what it was about and like what does each section need. Um, each element in that poster. Um, they, what we did is in collaboration, we created a poster demystified document. And here's a link, and it was created in collaboration with the success specialists over multiple semesters because they understood, because they work with the students themselves and they understood with, in, in the research project and they're intimately involved in helping mentor them so that they have a successful um, a product at the end. And part of it is like learning from their questions, learning what the misconceptions are, what does it mean? And so what it, um, in looking at it, it was an iterative process. I think it was over the course of a year and a half or even two years where like each time the poster demystified document got better and better and better so that it would be very in student friendly language. And the current iteration of poster demystified is in this link below. You will receive a link. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but I know the, the link to these slides will be available online once the webinar is posted. So um, you have access to this if you want to also see how a student friendly language of what, now how, how um, based on the um, input of our success specialists, like where are the hurdles? And other resources also were our industry community government partners. What they would do is um, we had presentations, they were happy to come to our class. And there was definitely, but it's important also is that there was buy-in and that the deadline goals are very important. If your goals and your, your goals and your partner's goals are different, you really, really, really need to know that, you know, what did they want from this relationship? Is it a good fit? And, and to make sure that it is mutually beneficial because that's really where it's a win-win. The lessons learned. Um, so fall 2019, started off, this was again, I was in uh, foundling mode or youngling, didn't know what I was doing. I kind of knew the idea of what I wanted to do. And then what it is, the mistake that I made is I invited the industry partner too soon. I think it was week two or three. So what happened is half my class dropped. So you learn, don't, you don't do that. Um, when, when, then what I did is I reached out to my colleagues in the bioscience, like how do you go about doing this? Because that was not the outcome. And part of it is, is it was too soon for the partners to come in at that time because the students just got started with class. They just barely learned their first few lessons. And now they're the partners saying, we're gonna be doing a capstone project and here's what we were interested in. And it was just, it was too much too fast. So what I learned from that, and that's why you saw earlier, is 
what we do is we do the content first with small mini projects that will prepare them for when they get to the Gapson project to then pick their topic of interest. So we introduce the partners in later. We wait around eight, week eight or nine or 10 as they're starting to think about what Capstone project they want to do. And that again, creates that mutual buy-in. And so what you see over here is that you'll see um, different, um, and so what it is is uh, during the Capstone project, the partners are invited. Um, this uh, pre-pandemic, we only did posters. And then the next part is, let's see, timing and milestones. And the other thing that I learned in that time is that you need to actually produce small deliverables along the way because the error was is like, okay, just meet with them every week. Myself and my uh, success specialist, we would meet with each of the teams and talk about it. And oftentimes they just didn't get things done or they were stuck. And so giving that, like, you must finish this part of the poster by now and doing it in different sections because then they would create their um, presentation from it after. So they, um, presentations went well in the end. Also, they had opportunities. So this is an opportunity that occurs. One of the things is by them presenting, they have the opportunity to share with researchers on something, uh, researchers and um, industry partners and um, other interested individuals. Um, the um, I lost my train of thought. So um, when we're looking at this particular poster, you can see two things. One is the partners visiting. The other one is the opportunity, for example, when we have college events that they can share their research poster as well. Um, so the lessons learned were you know, incorporated. Okay, we're gonna do better pacing. And then we're also going to bring the partners in later. We're also gonna do milestones, okay. And everything was going really well. So this was now spring 2020. And then somewhere around March, 2020, I think we all know what happened. There was the pandemic and everyone was sent home. Or at least at our college, um, there was spring break that became spring permanent and then everyone shifted to online. And they, they had just started, like they selected their topic. They found, they formed the teams that they want to do it. And it's like, okay, what do we do now? So then there was, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do it through Zoom and we would meet through, you know, breakout rooms and uh, continue the projects. And then what the, the presentation was, they would do the whole presentation through Zoom. And then we would have breakout groups where they could then share their poster after the presentation. So one of the lasting impacts is first of all, just being flexible. Okay, well, we wanna do it here. So the implementation in the Zoom online was, okay, well, you can still do this because they were invested in what they already started the project. And then, so that was how we honored and um, kept uh, the integrity of the project. And it turns out that that was what we then did during those few semesters where we were working from home. Now in fall 2020, this was a class where they started online. So the idea of the, what I call the personal relationships that you have in an in-person class, that didn't happen because they, everyone started in Zoom. So the question was, okay, we have this new normal and trying to figure out what worked in uh, previous uh, semesters and what was still needed. So what was the, so we said, okay, we're gonna do the same thing. The pacing was good, it worked out fine. But then something unusual happened. Um, the first thing is, is because there was not the um, class, uh, I think we also were learning how to uh, manage a class uh, through this new medium, which was Zoom. And so one of the things was is, uh, what we learned is, is there was extreme resistance and stubbornness of students regarding feedback. So like in the past is like, okay, well, this is, you know, this is an error, this is, needs to be corrected. During that iterative phase, like, okay, here's the feedback. Uh, you need to look at your statistics, you made an error, you maybe wanna use a different visualization, like all these things that we would take for granted, like, yeah, a student will go back and fix it. Come back next week, it still looks the same. It's like, why is this happening? So that was one of them. Uh, some teams were not effectively practicing uh, practicing their pacing. It was either too short or too long. So their presentation, when they got to the very end, it would be like a 25 minute presentation when it's supposed to be slotted for about 10 minutes. Um, invited guests also, that was an unexpected thing where, okay, so we would, I invited a lot of people who would come like in the past to, you know, the industry partners and also uh, faculty and staff and students to do because the idea is for the Capstone students, they are presenting in front of uh, a group that is representative of an, uh, an audience that had comes from different perspectives. So I really wanted them to have a, um, a authentic experience presenting um, scientific results to the general community and to, uh, to everyone at different varying levels of expertise. Problem is, in the first semester in fall, uh, a lot of people left 
after the presentation was done, say, okay, we're going to do breakouts. Please wait for your students to do set up their posters. And then I set up their rooms and then the breakout occurred. They left. So we then were scrambling to at least have some conversation between. So that was a problem. And the other lesson, so um, the other lesson learned is that some students were resistant to the idea that the scope that should go beyond personal interest. So again, that stubbornness about niche interests. Um, so that became part of the practice. Like we, that became an, an explicit question. Can you imagine this uh, and someone else caring beyond it? So a plan was made. One of the things that we did is um, we met with every student personally at the very beginning. So what it is, is what I mean by that is Part of the class was you're going to meet with me and you're going to meet with your um, success specialist, make that a required part um, at the very beginning of the semester. So what it is, is we established the relationships to begin with. And so uh, myself and my success specialist um, and students would be incentivized. Okay, you're going to, you're going to meet with each of us. So it was a, it was a zoom meeting and also learn about what the students want. So we made that an explicit thing because with a class, you can meet with everyone at once and you establish a report. With Zoom, it, would, it was done on an individual basis. So that was the plan. For the invited guests, we just over-invited guests because we would know that even if some leave, you don't want to leave to the point, you would, even if some leave, there'd be enough to still be um, traveling between Zoom rooms. And with pacing, we were explicit. It's gotta be 10 minutes and you're going to practice with myself or the success specialist or both of us to make sure your pacing's right. And so a plan was made and then we implemented that in the fall 2020, so it was spring 2021. And then it worked, um, we, we looked back at our results and it worked really, really well. And so the spring 2021 semester, this was still during um, live uh, Zoom classes, uh, worked really, really well to the point where um, students were now, I mean, the goal of this, um, these cures was give a student an authentic research experience because they did something novel and they presented to a group, uh, an entire group, these novel results, they educate the field. So they get an APA reference based on what they worked on and they could put that on their resume. And then I said, if you need a recommendation letter and, and, and those recommendation letters to any of the students who requested, I could very specifically go down to my notes on those different projects and write them a recommendation letter. And I would say, at a, a 100% success rate on everyone who wanted to get into an internship or um, an REU, which is a, a, a research experience or anything else as a result of it. So this, um, this particular student who I have here, one of the lessons learned, uh, he actually kind of said, why are we, the, the, the reason why I, I think of this student is he basically fought me during the class saying, why are we doing this? I thought this is just a statistic class. Why are we doing a project? So on and so on. So. Um, I said, just trust me, this will work and it's going to open up doors that you had never imagined possible. And so um, he wrote back around the end of the semester because he applied for an internship at NASA at Ames Research Center. And um, the words speak for themselves. Um, he was doing the research internship and um, it turns out um, they were, the, that particular team worked on breast cancer um, because they had a personal um, reason for choosing that, uh, that um, trajectory and it turned and what it ended up happening is um, our this student he ended up with a research at NASA Ames Research Center I've been in touch with him now he also got an internship at um, the desert uh, what not desert um, DHS which is Department of Homeland Security so this one uh, cure led to a lot of opportunities for him and he's a cybersecurity intern another uh, um, student who um, went and got um, a summer internship or a summer RU. Uh, she went to, I believe, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, she went to James Madison University for one and she was able to hold her own with graduate students. So one of the things is, is, is you don't have to wait to graduate school to have an authentic research experience. This could be done at the community college. Um, a lot of, the, I would say most of the skills they learn in early part, they will have a foot ahead of anyone who is in their fourth year or graduate or first year graduate school. Um, so some other lessons that were learned now. So this was all going great. And so the next semester, we went back basically to classes, right? So this was that first semester back to um, our fir the first semester back to uh, school. And so they were in person classes. So one of the really, I would say the positives were that students were very happy to be back and they were fully engaged with those projects. 
the downside is that they were very small classes because again, it makes sense. There were still a lot of online classes. People were uncomfortable. We were um, still in the mask mandate. So we were, you know, so everyone had different comfort level of, okay, do I be in person or do I um, learn from home? And part of the thing is, is because they were very small classes, the thing that it also created for faculty was uncertainty. I had many classes to cancel because there was just not enough enrollment in person. So then I would take an online class or a live on. I would then not take, but teach an, life, uh, an online class or a, a live online class during those times. For the asynchronous class, one of the things that was learned is they do not reliably engage with each other nor communicate effectively in this modality. And I've heard of this in anecdotally as well, but I've experienced it myself as a uh, uh, teaching these courses. And so the Q in this format has not been successful in them thus far, at least for me. There might be a case where, where that is, has been successful. And so I would say, you know, looking ahead, that does represent both a challenge and opportunity. I mean, that is something that the research team is looking at uh, from STEM Cure, like what's going on. There's some preliminary results. And if you come to Omaha, you can hear about it. That's my pitch for Omaha. So I will be presenting on the research end of this. This is um, a very much focused on um, the practitioner end of um, this, the CURE uh, methodology. So future directions. There's further revising and improving of the developed curriculum um, um, involving the partners um, and communicating and looking at viable alternatives when partnerships discontinue. Now, the disruption that happened in school did happen everywhere. So for example, uh, there was a lot of turnover in both of the um, partners that we had. So some of the relationships that we had built up with the health department and with the environmental quality department, um, a lot of people don't work there anymore. So it's like starting over. So that part of it is having a plan. Okay, what if your partner doesn't like you, you know, you contact them and they don't work there anymore. What do you do then? So that's, the, and then staying open and adapting. Uh, one of the things is with our classes, they're, they're a bit smaller now. Um, and just you know, working with the flow. Um, I think that I think that is a huge takeaway: just staying open to adapting and seeing where uh, how to keep continuously improving. And again, being reflective: what works doesn't work in fully synchronous and asynchronous online modality. I think that for anyone who wants to take that charge, I think that's going to be the next big thing, like trying to figure out how that works when we're doing online learning. And again, continuing to study the effect of student retention, persistence, self-efficacy, and pro-STEM attitudes. Um, there's a lot of preliminary data that's showing that this is a great practice and that students who are in in-person modalities have, um, have really benefited from it. And I also look at the students who um, transitioned to careers and internships that were very meaningful for them and their majors. So there's a lot I say that's good that's happening. So these are my references. Um, you want to learn more about it or what is the research that informed this practice. And again, I want to give acknowledgement to everyone who's helped along the way. I want to again um, acknowledge and thank the STEM Cure team, Robin Cotter, Anna, Marty, Sabrina, Elena Ortiz, and Robin Cook, um, to all the success specialists, Cassandra and Mark Karyos and Andrea and Gabrielle and Stacy, Alicia and Yasmin. Um, they have made a major contribution in um, the cures are better as a result of their contributions along the way. To Sean, I would also say thank you for being so generous with his time. This is when I was just still trying to figure out how um, cures are, and to also our partners in our institution um, who have supported this along the way. And of course, NSF, because uh, the grant is what started this all. And that's what I have uh, for this particular presentation. Um, it is Star Chris May the Fourth, uh, May the Fourth be with you. Um, and if you want to learn about the STEM Cure project, there is a link there on the page below. So I'm seeing the chat. I see a couple of bubbles, but I probably would need to close this presentation to see what's on the chat. Yeah, I think if you just stop sharing, you can see. Okay. The chat. So I have sent, uh, put in the um, link for the survey, and I don't see any questions in the Q and A. And I don't believe there were really any questions in the chat either. Um, there might be something now. It's like a wonderful, they're thanking you. And that's, 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 that's nice. pretty Thank much, you. yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could, um, I'm not sure if you can copy and paste that one of those links you had 
um, noted in your presentation, you could put that in the power, uh, not in the PowerPoint, in the um, chat if you want. But like you said, it will be uploaded into um, the uh, oh, webinar you. archive yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what it is, is I made sure before uh, um, sharing the um, presentation with Mary that all the links work, so. I know that. Details, right? <laughs> <laughs> all the details, yes. Yeah. Yes. So all of them are there. If you're curious about learning about the Stand Cure project, that one is easy to get because that's my last slide right now. If okay. you're curious about how it worked, I'm going to put that in the chat and then everything else. Oh, I have to actually click escape to exit. There we go. I think this will, I'm hoping this will work. Let's see. If, if people want to like visit the site, itself and what the project is about. Um, the other ones, the huge long links um, are available in the presentation themselves. There you go. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, I think I will stop um, the recording. Um... And I'm very appreciative to all of you and thank you so much for thanking me. Thank you.